Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover The Path to Power by Robert A. Caro. This is the first of four books that are part of Caro's The Years of Lyndon Johnson series. This is book eight for my 2021 reading list. There's a quote in the intro, and it goes like this. Without understanding the hill country of Texas, no one will ever understand Lyndon Johnson. End quote. That pretty much encapsulates this book. It is a book about Lyndon Johnson, but Lyndon Johnson only makes up about half of the book. The rest is the context that helps you understand Lyndon Johnson. This book and this whole four book series has been described as books within a book. There's another quote and it goes like this. Knowledge of the inner workings of Lyndon Johnson's character illuminates a presidency. Knowledge of the broader outlines of his life illuminates far more, end quote really gets into just the way this book is set up. You can you can learn a lot about his character and how that illuminates a presidency. But the deeper you go into his life, the further back you go into his life, the further back even into his family's life and the life of people in the hill country of Texas, the further you go into Lyndon Johnson's friends, the people that helped him, the people that hated him, the people that loved him, the deeper your understanding of this man. This is probably the most exhaustive look you can get at a human being. I tracked my reading time and this book took me 31 hours and eight minutes to read. There are three other books in this set. And when I consider the total number of pages, I will likely be spending around 120 hours with Lyndon B. Johnson over the next few months. To put that into perspective, I read straight through the Bible last year as as my first book for my 2020 reading list, and that took me 105 hours from Genesis to Revelation. It is going to take me longer to read this series than it it will have taken to read the entire Bible. And though this series is called The Years of Lyndon Johnson, you're, you're getting all the context around it. You're getting the history lessons, the personal relationship stories, the civics lessons. You're, you're, you're seeing the full picture of this man, the complexity of this man. So with that in mind, in, in this book going into deep, deep parts of LBJ, let's just take a step back. And who, who was LBJ? Just at a, at a very surface level. Well, first off, he was the 36th president of the United States. He became the president the day that C.S. Lewis died. And someone else died on that same day. His name was John F. Kennedy. LBJ was the VP. And and just just a quick note here, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, I will be calling him LBJ for most of this episode. LBJ was the vice president at the time. And so when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, LBJ became president on November 22nd, 1963. He was then elected in 1964 as president and uh, did not run again in 1968. So he was president for a total of, of five years. His father was named Sam, and his father was a politician in Texas. And his mother was uh, an idealist, a college-educated idealist. And Sam was uh, was Sam had an interesting life. His his father, he was kind of at a, a high when he was a politician. He was doing well. Uh, and he was he was very well respected. People loved him. He he worked very hard, and he he would never take a, even a meal from from somebody. He, he he would always pay his own meal, his own drinks. And while a lot of other politi- politicians in Austin, Texas, at the time were getting kickbacks and, and other sorts of of payments, he never took them. He actually then went through a period where he made some poor business decisions and got into debt and then remained in debt for the rest of his life. So his father had gone from kind of the high of of the highs down to sinking so low. And there's one story that really captures this. And it is that Sam Johnson, LBJ's father, was was responsible for a road being built, a, a, a major road in this area of Texas. So he sponsored that bill. He got it, got it passed. That was in the good days. In the bad days, later on, he actually was a day laborer working on that very road that he had once sponsored. 
the this is small town America, and so everyone knows everyone has seen this fall from grace. And the lesson that LBJ takes is that the reason that it it this happened is because his parents were honest and idealistic. And he was not going to go that route. He saw what happened to his family. He saw what happened to him, the ridicule that he got, uh, not, not even to mention the ridicule that his father got. So LBJ, the lesson he took from that is that pragmatism is the way. Don't take a stand. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't go the honest way because look, you, you go the honest way. This is how you're going to end up. But look at all the people that, that took money and, and were, were cheating. Look where they got, they, they made it. That was, that was LBJ's lesson. He, from there, he goes to college and his nickname in college is Bull Johnson, as in BS Johnson, as in Bull Crap Johnson. Uh, and people called that to him, to, to his face. So by the time he's in college, he is already known as a habitual liar, someone that you cannot trust, someone that uh, may stab you in the back, may, may look at you smiling and, and grab you by the shoulders and kind of hug you while he's talking to you. But then, but then uh, the minute you turn around, he will stab you in the back. And he, he's, known, he's known as that right away. He, uh, from, from there, uh, just some other, other jobs, but then he becomes a secretary to a congressman from Texas. So he moves up to Washington, D.C. After that, he becomes a congressman. He's a congressman for 11 years then uh, later on becomes a senator and vice president and, and president. And while president, he's, he's most well-known for the major advances in civil rights, but also the escalating of the Vietnam War. As for the author of this book, Robert Caro, he has spent four decades on this series of books. Four decades there are four books in the series. There's a fifth one in the works. And in 2018, Robert Caro said they will, the fifth book will release in two to 10 years. So kind of a, a big gap there. But um, if it does come out this year, I will add it to the list and, and I will, will finish that book as well. In writing this book, Robert Caro lived in both the Hill Country of Texas and in Washington, D.C., just to get a better idea of of where LBJ grew up and then where he really uh, got kind of increased in, in power all the way to the presidency. He interviewed as many people as possible who knew LBJ. This book, The Path to Power, covers LBJ's life from 1908 to 1941. The next book, Means of Ascent, goes from 1941 to 1948. The, the actual time of the, the book spans a lot more than that because you're learning about LBJ's grandparents who came to the Hill Country. And uh, so you're, you're getting a broader scope than just that. But as for LBJ's life, this book covers 1908 to 1941. It's titled The Path to Power. And LBJ immediately is presented as someone who knows that he wants power. He loves having power over other kids when he's young. He loves having power over others in college and in school and just his whole life. He just loves lording it over people. And he kind of have an, has an idea of what his path will be to get there. So the path to power, he, he has in his mind what it's going to be like. It doesn't exactly go that way, but he's, he's just dead set on, on getting there. He, uh, he, he's described in this way by, by Robert Caro that his passions were at ambition's command. His passions were at ambition's command. Basically, ambition controlled his actions. Caro says of him that he lacked any discernible limits in any consistent moral foundation. Ambition was his moral framework, his moral foundation. But what's really interesting in this book is you see, it, it's not that that ambition just leads to negative things or, or only positive things. It, 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 it crosses the chasm of, of where that ambition leads. So it could do tremendous good or it could do, do just vicious harm. His ambition could make grown men cry, but it could make them cry in, in adoration or in, in just despair. LBJ knew he wanted to be president and he would do whatever it took to get there. I mean, whatever it took to get there. Remember that the, the, his moral foundation was ambition, whatever it took. He would also just give everything for his job, as if, as if his life depended on whatever job he was in, and it didn't matter if that was a low-level job or or 
uh, secretary to a congressman or a congressman himself. He was going to give every single thing he had. And sometimes he worked himself into the hospital. Stats for this book, it took me 31 hours, eight minutes, as I mentioned earlier. That was from January 20th through February 14th. 768-page book, so that was around 31 pages per day. The rest of this episode will consist of two segments. In the next segment, I'll cover the good, the bad, and the ugly about LBJ. I'll cover three different stories for each each of those, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then in segment three, I will, will close out how I close out all my episodes with the one thing, my one key takeaway from the path to power. And I will I will tie that one takeaway into a a story that that really captures a lot about LBJ. I was saying this is this is such a big book. It took so long to read. Is there just one story in there that that really captures a lot of LBJ's character, uh, things he was good at, things he was bad at, uh, his his way with people, and and so I'm tying in my one thing, the thing that stuck out to me the most in this book, with one story that really captures a lot about LBJ. You're probably familiar with the quote by Lord Acton that says, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, that's not totally the case with Lyndon Johnson. And I want to read a a section that comes at the end of a chapter about his college years. And his college years were on the ugly side of things. The things he did, I'll, I'll highlight some of those later on. The things he did to fellow students are just plain ugly and horrible, and they were hard to read about. And so let me read the paragraph at the end of that, par- that chapter about his college years. Some men, perhaps most men, who attain great power are altered by that power, not Lyndon Johnson. The fire in which he had been shaped, that terrible youth in the hill country as the son of Sam and Rebecca Johnson, had forged the metal of his being a metal hard to begin with into a metal much harder. In analyses of other famous figures, college, being only a part of the formulating process that creates character, deserves only cursory study. But the years Lyndon Johnson spent at college are revealing of his character as a whole, all the more revealing, in fact, because at college, there are no complications of national or international politics or policy to obscure character. All the traits of personality which the nation would witness decades later all the traits which affected the course of history can be seen at San Marcos, naked and glaring and raw. The Lyndon Johnson of college years was the Lyndon Johnson who would become president. He had arrived at college that Lyndon Lyndon Johnson. He came out of the hill country formed, shaped, into a shape so hard it would never change. End quote. I want to get into the good and the bad and the ugly. In segment one, I mentioned that ambition drove this man Ambition was his moral framework, his moral foundation, and nothing was to ever get in the way of his ambition. Be it a person, a thing, a position, ambition was, was his driving force. And that led to good things, it led to bad things, and it led to just plain ugly things. And so I'm going to highlight a few of those things for each category there in, in this chapter. First, in the good, he taught... Uh, uh, it was, I believe during college, he taught at a school in Cotula, which is south of San Antonio. It was all Mexican students. And so, so he, he came in, he did not, LBJ did not speak Spanish, but he ran the, the class and it was all in English. He, like you, you, everything had to be in English. He would get there before, he would get there super early in the morning and stay super late at night at this school. And he just gave it his all. He treated this like the most important thing in his life. And he is just in the middle of nowhere teaching a, teaching a class. He got, he got a ton of extracurricular activities into this school. They didn't have a basketball when he got there. He got them a, a basketball so they could play games. That's how, that's how poor this area was. People interviewed 40 years later after, after LBJ had been their teacher, recall how he had changed their lives, how he had had given them so much and how he had given so much of himself to this school. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, a, a second thing under the good, there are two chapters of this. Well, th- there's one chapter of this book that it would be worth buying this book and just reading 
that chapter if, if, if you don't have the time to read this whole book. And that chapter is called Chapter 27, and it's called Sad Irons. And it is broken up into two parts. The first half of Chapter 27 describes the life of a, of a male farmer in the hill country with no electricity. The second half describes the life of a female farmer, the wife of the husband, what her life would have been been like as a farmer's wife with no electricity in the hill country of Texas. And it is one of the most devastating things you can read. You cannot, you can't even fathom that this is taking place in 90 years ago, in 1930s Texas. And the, if, if you feel bad about your life, you know, if, you, if you're starting to feel sad or bad about your life, just open up t- chapter 27 and it, and it will flip your brain. It, it's, it's an incredibly sad, poignant, I mean, you, you, you almost feel these people's pain. That's chapter 27, sad irons. Chapter 28 is called, I'll get it for you. And I'll get it for you is a quote. And it is a quote from Lyndon Johnson because he says, I will get you electricity. So you've just read about how unbelievably sad and hard and tragic these lives are. And then in the next chapter, LBJ says, I will use my influence in D.C. to get this electricity for you. The electricity, the the electric companies are not going to get wires to you guys. They're not going to get electricity to you guys because you live too far away from each other. I will, I will see to it that this happens. I will get it for you. And he does. He gets these farmers electricity. It was really interesting. During, while I was reading this book, I, uh, uh, my, my grandfather passed away last year, and he grew up as a farmer in Wisconsin. And I, my grandmother, uh, his wife, is still alive. They were, they were married uh, over 70 years. And she's in her late 90s, and uh, I just uh, try to call her every now and then. And so uh, I was asking her about Grandpa. And really just from, from, from reading this, this book and, and asking about what it was like to be a farmer. And he didn't have electricity either. So my grand, grandma was telling, you know, in the early days of what it would have been like for him, uh, not having electricity, not having running water, not having uh, toilets in the house, and just how hard that was. And then, and then the shift of when he got electricity. And, and it really happened when he married my grandmother. He he got the house. Uh, he got electricity to the house. He got running water. He got, he he put in a toilet in in the house, and so that was the shift. And and you just imagine how different things are, uh, and, and especially for the the wife and and doing laundry and and washing and just how hard it was to go get water and and all of that and all of that changed with electricity. And here's Lyndon Johnson using his ambition and getting electricity for these farmers. It got to the point where people in the hill country started naming their kids after Lyndon Johnson because of that. Another section where uh, LBJ got mortgage relief to farmers. And these are people who had never had any sort of government assistance before in their life. I mean, they, they just did not feel connected at all to the, to the federal government. And this is when LBJ is a secretary to a congressman, and he gets mortgage relief for 67 farmers. This was in the 1930s during the depression and farmers are losing their, their land left and right because they just can't pay the mortgage. If it's a bad year, they can't pay it. He saw to it that mortgage relief was, was extended to these farmers. They were forever grateful. So those are a few things under the good category. Now let's go to the bad category. There's uh, when he was at college, he would do things uh, like what I mentioned before of of laughing with you, you know, treating you like a king, uh, looking you in the eye, be, appearing to be very interested in what you were saying, and then you would turn around and he would he would stab you in the back. There were people who left college because Lyndon Johnson was there, I, and not just one person, multiple people. And there, there's one quote I want to read here. It says this, Henry was very smart and he was very idealistic and he just could not tolerate what he saw as political purposes, says another student who was asked not to be identified. It was as if Henry, who had lived a very sheltered life, found out all at once just how dirty life could really be, end quote. So Henry's one of, one of the people that ends up leaving college just because 
LBJ is there and he, he, it's like he's confronted with evil for the first time and it is so startling and so he can't believe that somebody would have done what LBJ did to him that he just leaves the college. Multiple people leaving because of one person and, and, and just that lack of any moral foundation guiding his principles. There, uh, Caro says that LBJ just lacked any discernible limits and there was a lack of any consistent moral framework at all. Another thing under the bad category, LBJ was a congressman for 11 years and during that time he submitted a total of five bills. As a congressman, one of your responsibilities is to present bills. And uh, Robert Caro covers a number of different politicians at the time, a congressman that would have been the same time period as LBJ. And they had, you know, a ton of more bills. And Lyndon was just known as not ever standing up for anything. Like you could never pin him down as to what he believed. And he would do that on purpose because he he didn't want he didn't want something to come back and bite him or to have a position and then for for that to be taken from him. Someone towards the end of the book uh, says Lyndon will be found on no barricades, and that was just a common theme throughout his life. He would talk all the time. He was the life of the party. He was always talking, but he never said anything. He never you could never understand what he was what he believed, and it bothered people because. To a degree, he's supposed to, you're supposed to know where he stands. And then he, so he wouldn't do things on his own in terms of, of submitting bills. He wouldn't support people publicly who, again, he's, he's appearing to be friends with. He wouldn't support them publicly on their bills. And he wouldn't support people privately on their bills either. So that just kind of gets into the, to the bad of even when he's in his, his Congress role, he's not. He's not doing what he should be doing. He's, he is helping people, but he's not doing what he should be doing in, in the sense of bills because that might hurt him later on. So that, that's, uh, that's the bad. Now let's get into the, the ugly. And I'm going to read this. This is from, again, from his, his college days. One student, a bohemian farm boy, was generally immune from practical jokes because he was so slow and gullible. Some students believed he might be slightly retarded. As to be too defenseless a target, the student had a severe case of acne, and one evening talking with Johnson, Whiteside, and another student, he said girls wouldn't go out with him because of it. Recalls Whiteside, Lennon said to him that the cure was to get fresh cow manure and put it on your face. He said, oh, go on, and Lennon said, didn't you ever turn over a cow pile and see how white the grass was underneath, how the manure bleached the grass? So Lennon said, let's drive the boy out to get some. And we all four of us drove out to some pasture and he gets out and walks a long ways and we can't believe he's this gullible. And he comes back with some, which he had put in a shoebox. When they return to San Marcos, Lan, uh, Lyndon tells him to take a towel and cut eye holes in it and wrap it around his face. He came into our room and asked how it was. And Lyndon, Lyndon said, you don't have enough on to do any good. He made him put more on. In the morning, he smelled so bad you couldn't go near him. And then Lyndon tells everyone the story. And the next day when the boy walks in, everyone goes, moo. I tell you, that was the worst thing I ever took part in, end quote. So Lyndon convinces a boy who many thought uh, likely had uh, a form of Down syndrome. He convinces him to put feces on his face to cure acne and, and then just mocks him. And this friend who was along for that says that was the worst thing I ever took part in. There were a couple situations where there were, so Lyndon Johnson was very young when he was getting into, uh, when he was a congressman and, uh, and, and even as a secretary to the, to a congressman, he, he was just, he was, he was in Washington DC and he was, he was quite young. So there were a number of, of people, of men who, who kind of took LBJ under their wing, almost as a father-son type of relationship. And there was one uh, by by a man named Mr. Marsh, and this was actually not a politician. He, he owned a string of newspapers in Texas, but he took LBJ under his wing. And LBJ would, would kind of let him, let him in because this guy was really interested in politics and make it seem like LBJ was taking his advice. He'd let, he'd let Mar Mr. Marsh write speeches for him and then say that he was going to give them. But, but the worst thing is that Mr. Marsh had this 
was deeply in love with this woman named Alice Glass. And LBJ started sleeping with her. They had an affair. LBJ is married at this point to Lady Bird. He's having an affair with Alice Glass, who is uh, dating and, and is about to get married to Mr. Marsh. Mr. Marsh is giving LBJ money, is writing great coverage of him in, in, his, in all of his newspapers. And the way that LBJ repays him is to, is to sleep with his girlfriend and to have an affair with her. And Mr. Marsh never finds out. And this goes on for, for many, many years. There's another man named Sam Rayburn. Uh, Sam Rayburn comes up all the time in this book. And there were actually like one or two chapters fully dedicated to Sam. And you're kind of thinking, what's going on here? We haven't heard LBJ's name in a long time. But that background is necessary. And, and Sam Rayburn had tremendous power in D.C. And people were scared to death of him. But there was that father-son type of a relationship between Sam, the older man, and LBJ, kind of the, the son figure, to where LBJ would go up and kiss, kiss Sam on the head. There's, there's a part where LBJ, for love of power and ambition, throws Sam under the bus to Franklin Roosevelt. And you're just thinking, here's this man who has helped LBJ so much politically, and LBJ just has no qualms about throwing him under the bus. The other part of the ugly is... Uh, is LBJ's marriage to Lady Bird. Well, one, there's there's the the affairs. Uh, secondly, he had always said his whole life that he was going, going to marry for money, and and he, she came from a wealthy family. But third, with with Lady Bird, is that he just humiliated her in front of others. She was very introverted, very shy, and he would just ridicule her, uh, demand thing from, things from her, demand that she do things, and everyone there would be so embarrassed for her. And that's just how he treated her all the time. And it was like, he was super nice up to them getting engaged. Their engagement lasted uh, less than 24 hours. They were married. And the day after people are amazed at how he is treating, how poorly he is treating, treating her. So there's the good, the bad and the ugly, a few stories for, for each of those. This book is, is full of them. And it, it's just surprising, you know, the, the, his ambition could do tremendous good for people. It could make, it could make grown men cry in adoration. It could make uh, fathers and mothers name their children Lyndon after this man, but it could also make people leave college, something that was so difficult to get into at that time and pay for, to leave college because they could not be in the same place as this man. Now into segment three, and the one thing, my one key takeaway from The Path to Power. You've got, you've got the ambitious LBJ, you've got the pragmatism, you've got the leaving of the idealism behind, the honesty, seeing wh where that led his, his parents. He was, he was the pragmatic man. He was the man of ambition. And there's one thing he did in nearly every one of his positions that changed things that that led to success and this may sound like the weirdest strangest one thing that you could pull from a, a book of this magnitude but but here it is he answered his mail he answered his mail now let me get into that a little bit more lbj becomes the secretary for congressman kleberg of texas lbj gets there and he gets into Kleberg's office, and what he sees is a room full of mail. Kleberg is known for not really taking the Congress role all that seriously. So he's out playing golf a lot. He's really not doing the things he's supposed to, supposed to do. And so when LBJ gets there, there's a room full of mail. And so what LBJ starts doing, and with the help of, of two or three other aides, is to start answering every single piece of mail. They set up a system, they get there early. And so we saw that with LBJ getting to that job at school, getting there early, staying late. He does that. He gets there you know, five or six in the morning. They can't even drink coffee while they're working because that might take too much time. And they work till late at night every day. 
And these letters are from constituents in District 14 of Texas. And they need help. This is the 1930s. Times are tough. This is the middle of the Depression. And they need help. It's veterans. It's farmers. It's people from District 14, from the Hill Country of Texas. And they need help from their congressman. And their congressman is not helping them. So LBJ fills that void, and he starts answering every single letter. He gets a system in place where he answers every letter the day it is received. These letters are all requesting something. So LBJ has to call different departments to get answers, to get help for these people. And and he does it. So while the other two aides are the ones typing the letters and, and doing the correspondence, LBJ is on the phone or he's meeting people in person. And so he gets to know Washington, D.C. He gets to know how things are done. He gets to know who to talk to. He gets to know what department does what, what department can help his constituents. And he gets answers for every single letter. He gets to the point where he starts writing letters just on his own to people in his district. He sends a letter to every graduating high school senior in his district. He starts asking questions in his letters. So now he's starting to gather uh, market data in, in a way of, hey, you know, what, what's going on in your life? What, what are you seeing? What, what else can we help with? And so he's, he's hearing directly from his people. And at this time, 1930s America, the way that a, a congress, congressman or congresswoman can stay in touch with their constituents, especially when it's 2,000 miles away, is by mail. LBJ takes full advantage of that. He starts, he starts by answering the mail in Congressman Kleberg's name. He slyly shifts that to where he starts answering it from his own name. He read and he signed every single letter. If it had one error in it, it was not acceptable. It would have to be redone. He required absolute obedience from those two aides that helped. And this is kind of a, a, something you see throughout the book. He, he, his biggest thing he wanted from people was loyalty the, from people that worked for him. Loyalty that if he called at midnight, they would answer the call and do what he needed them to do. He worked these people to the bone. He worked himself to the bone. They, they were, they were, he was working as hard, if not harder than, than everyone else, but it, they perhaps didn't have that ambition driving them that he did. And so it led to nervous breakdowns, uh, alcoholism, making grown men cry uh, for, for the people that, that worked for him. And so that, that's part of this larger story here, that, that this one thing that, that stuck out to me so much is also the one thing that, that captures a lot about LBJ. This wasn't the only position that he did this. There were other positions, and you read about them, about them in this book. He did the simple task of, of answering mail and answering mail immediately. That is such a high sign of respect that if someone is asking the congressman for help to answer them immediately, to get an answer for them, to help them in in any way they could, it's actually the highest calling of that job. It's what you're supposed to do. His That congressman was not doing it. LBJ took it on himself. And that was really the, the thing that started strongly his path to power and meeting people and in getting to know Washington DC. It just makes me think of how how I work. I do website development and I've done that for 12 years and I have some great clients. And one of the things that 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 made me stick out at first is I approached it from a business point of view. And I would answer people immediately for their emails. And over the years, I've, I've just kind of, I've gotten away with from that in the sense of, I, I just need time to focus on projects I'm working on. And so email would not get answered as quickly. But after reading this book, I've, I've gone back to that. And I, I know there's a good balance between ans- answering people immediately and, and being at the beck and call of emails and, and setting aside time for projects. But there, there is a huge sign of respect that if somebody asks you a question, you do everything you can to get the answer to help them out as quick as quickly as you can. And so just in reading this book, that's something that that I've I've shifted 
in in my life. But you see him answering the mail, and and that led to so many opportunities in his life of just doing that simple thing, doing it well, doing it perfectly, doing it to the best of his ability. And wherever that mail, whatever was requested in that mail, that's what he did. So to recap, there's a, there's a story that Robert Caro shares where while LBJ, LBJ was in college, he hired a ghostwriter that wrote a number of articles for him. And Caro says that many other biographers of LBJ look to those articles as early signs of what LBJ would become, not having any clue that LBJ had actually hired a ghostwriter. And he, and he says, many biographers of LBJ stop at that point without digging around further or looking or even realizing that LBJ had not even written these articles. And that's just one example. There are many examples in this book where, where Robert Caro just points out, you know, most, most biographies first have stopped at this point. And so they look at this side of the story and they think this, but if you, if you pull out, if you look at the broader context, if you spend 50 pages describing the hill country of Texas, if you spend two chapters talking about Sam Rayburn and how that ties in, and you look at all these pieces together, Those other biographers got a very small percentage of the story. Here's the broader part of that story. And that is what makes this book so powerful. I'm on the first book. It covered it covered 1908 to 1941. There are three other books and there's a fifth on the way. This is a deep, deep, deep look into the man of LBJ. But you are learning so much about everything else going on. You're learning about how politics are working. You're looking about how civics and how personal relationships work. And it it is it is amazing. It is a it is a work of art. It took me 31 hours to read this one book and I was not bored for one of those hours. This helps you understand how complete incomplete other books are. There was no st- stone left unturned. In, in this book. One other thing that what that really stuck out to me in 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 this book, and, and I'll finish the, the recap of the book is with this, is the importance of personal relationships in LBJ's life. And I just wonder the whole time I was reading this, I was just wondering how much of that is being lost right now with with COVID, with the restrictions with with coronavirus and, and the restrictions on face-to-face meetings. How much of local politics, of national politics, of international politics, how much are we losing right now by not having that personal relationships, the personal interaction? So just something to, to think about. But I, I, I do hope you, you read this book. If, if not, uh, just buy the book and, and read chapter 27, Sad Irons. Uh, but I do hope you'll pick up this series. It is incredible. It will change how you think about biographies and and you will just you'll learn so much this is almost like taking a college course uh just just reading these this book that's going to do it for this episode thank you for listening i'd love to hear from you if if you have read this book if you've read the series i would i'd love to hear from you i'd love to hear what your one thing is your what your one key takeaway is from from the path to power you can email me at eric at books of titans.com You can also go to the website. It is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. You can also follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter, and that's just at Books of Titans. I'll be back in a couple weeks, and I will be discussing the second book from this series, The Means of Ascent, uh, or actually just it's just Means of Ascent, and. Uh, and then I'll be reading the other two books after that. So I, I will do an episode about each of the four books of the series, and then I'll probably do a final episode that just covers the, the entire series about uh, LBJ. And, the, and uh, So until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out. <laughs>